Hello everyone, so my name is John Ford and I have decided to share the presentation that I did at BIM Show Live 2020 as I've had quite a few requests. Now the presentation that I held at BIM Show Live that went very well, it was very successful, people were very engaging and I had a lot come back to me towards the end that said they, that they had learned a lot about how progress could be monitored but also how requirements from clients could be reviewed so they, they felt like they took a lot from it and and that's always a good thing because there's nothing worse to go into these events uh, these events and then not actually learning anything uh, substantial to go away from because it does take a lot out of your time so this presentation uh, was on the business as usual the 2020 mandate and to discuss where are we really so some key questions that come to mind, what does business as usual actually mean and how can we measure our progress? And that's what this presentation is focused on resolving or answering today. So I am John Ford from a major construction and specialist service provider called Gallup for Try. Um, I've been in the industry about 15 years now and I've been in this field of work since day one so as soon as I joined the industry I got thrown into the deep end because I was on one of the first Avanti projects and Avanti was a, a, a project or scheme that was running um, around about 2002-3 I think was when I joined the industry and a project was uh, being run by Costains at the time that I had some involvement in and it was my kind of job to understand or, and, and articulate the requirements of that project uh, to try and, and push it forward in our business to, to become more information management orientated, um, but also focusing on the digital side. Now, all the stuff that happened in Avanti led to BS 1192 2007. So a lot of it fed into that uh, standard. So you can kind of get an insight into to the contribution that the, that Avanti kind of scheme and work had into our industry even today. So these are the three key milestones of our industry um, when it comes to our information modeling transformation. Now many of you may be thinking well a lot happened before 2011 and that's true we had the dawn of CAD, we had the Avanti schemes, we had the publication of BS 1190 2007, we had the early case studies and papers that were written about uh, using information modelling for more than just design and construction but the whole life stuff which was the maturity levels and BIM level 2 and all that. We also had the formation of the uh, task group that led the case study uh, for the 2011 construction strategy that mandated BIM. So there was all that kind of stuff that was happening before 2011, but 2011 was essentially the first time a catalyst had been introduced to make information management more important, but specifically the introduction of information modeling, which is the digital process. And that was introduced through the 2011 construction strategy that essentially said, go, um, go digital or go home. And that was, um, <laughs> well, to many that was outrageous. Uh, how dare the government come in and, and try and change our industry? They should keep their noses there. But it, they were right to do so. They were the largest client uh, of our industry, which is the public purse, essentially. And they wanted better outcomes in terms of information because they realized how much money they were losing during the operational side. Now, it's all well and good in 2011 having that catalyst introduced and there was some theory behind the whole life um, the whole life value creation of something called BIM level 2 but there was no process there was nothing that really defined how you actually achieve that and that's what comes into the next milestone in 2013 for the first time there was a process that underpinned how um, this BIM level 2 should be carried out and that process was relatively simple it was simply saying if you want to be able to support operational goals that's that's stuff that happens after design and construction you must have in place a clear idea from a client perspective a clear idea of what information you need and then be able to pass that information as a form of requirements down to your supply chain because they're the ones providing it to you so the first step is 
understand what you need as an organization and what you need from the asset as a whole that's about to be built what um, uh, your, your approach to how you pass those requirements down to your supply chain your supply chain must then plan and deliver it and then you as the client must take receipt and then uh, use that information and based on the later standards how you maintain it as well so that was the simple process that kind of underlined it and there were some clear responsibilities in terms of who needs to do that so you mr client must define your own requirements you can't leave it to anybody else because there's a lot to consider. You've got to understand what your organization needs in terms of regulatory information, what you need from the asset, and not just from the design and construction, but what do you actually need after it's been constructed? You know, the different organizations providing this. And then you must put it into dedicated uh, appointment specific documents like the employer's information requirements. So that was what happened in 2013. That was the next milestone that made this kind of possible, saying there's a process now that underpins what this BIM level two looks like. You must achieve this kind of process to get to this BIM level two. And 2016 was the next goal. And that wasn't just because that was when the mandate came into effect. So this was the point where if you hadn't become enabled to that process that was defined in uh, PAS 1192 part two in 2013, um, but it was also when uh, there was a huge change in, in, in our industry in terms of the types of organizations appearing. We had lots of BIM consultants appearing, information management consultants. And more specifically, we had um, the UK BIM Alliance. Now, the UK BIM Alliance um, was an organization that was set up to help support our industry moving forward in this time of transformation moving towards a digital and, and information modeling environment. Now, they set themselves a very ambitious target to try and make information, um, uh, uh, well, BIM level two, so information management and modeling for the whole life value creation, business as usual by 2020. So they, it was their kind of a role to facilitate that. Now, the levels of, of BIM have always been controversial, and I've never really liked them because unless you you really understand the flow of information on projects and you understand the, the, the modeling and the CAD side of things, and you also understand after construction how information is used, it's very difficult to get your head around the levels. But essentially what they were, they were just a, like a, a maturity framework. They were there to define how you could exploit information modeling in different ways. Now, the early forms of uh, information modeling exploitation, um, and, and, and you could go back to the BIM wedge and say this is kind of year level zero, but I don't want to apply those at the moment because many people have different understandings of BIM maturity, and ISO 19650 tries to reevaluate it again. So I'm not going to use those levels specifically, but um, the BIM maturities do have. Um, different kind of, of principles that behind them. So the early ones, the, the primary purpose of information modeling was, was drawing production. Uh, the early information modeling tools had significant power of producing large amounts of drawings uh, because it was based on a singular design or design model and you change a bit of that design, it changes all the drawings. So it, it was very much targeted at drawing production. Now it was, the there was not really any standards. There was no industry standards or anything like that. It was pretty much left to the organization. And if the organization didn't really care about other people's needs, then they would just have their own standards and say, OK, this is how we're going to uh, produce this information, this particular type of, of, of modeled information to support these these drawing outputs. And quite often, maybe it, those models weren't shared. And if they were, they may have been transformed into something else like like uh, DWGs, that kind of thing. So stripping a lot of the useful stuff out and just putting it into flat um, diagrams again. But there were a few bright sparks that were able to uh, come up with ways of uh, utilizing information modeling more beyond the drawing production. And this was the ability not only to produce better uh, drawings, but to help coordinate more effectively with others and uh, to also interrogate your designs more. So information modeling had a feature that CAD didn't originally, which was the ability to interrogate uh, your, your designs. So because there was a lot of information there, you could test what you had modeled in terms of a design, like, for example, um, uh, uh, energy modeling, all that kind of stuff. But sometimes it was just useful just to visualize 
the design more so you could understand how you're going to construct it. Now, typically, because this required more collaborative effort, collaborative standards had to be applied to a project. And this is typically around the BS 1192-2007, albeit you could use other standards, other countries have, have created standards, and sometimes uh, an organisation might come to the table and bring their own standards and say, everybody should really try and follow these if we all want to work in this collaborative environment. And that usually meant then that more native file formats were used um, and that there were clear exchange protocols for how information was shared with others. So within a common data environment, making sure that we get away from the postal system or through emails, but also sharing uh, uh, the, the traditional documents as well. But then there was this kind of um, surge of you know what, information modeling can be used more for just design and construction. I bet we can use it for whole life management of an asset. So that's beyond construction. And and, and that was that was quite optimistic at the time to say that, you know, most people had still not really mastered information modeling for just design coordination activities. But essentially they, they did want to push this further and they wanted to focus on the operational side of an asset. Now, to focus on the operational side of an asset, you've got to come up with some kind of industry-led standard here because you can't have each project trying to guess the needs of those that operate uh, facilities or maintain them uh, just using uh, specific project-led standards. So there has to be some industry uh, uh, principle that everybody has to follow, and that has to be incorporated into project standards. And typically operational activities, you know, not, not everybody can use 3D models and 3D is not really always that important depending on what task you want. It's important if you want to demonstrate to people how they escape uh, from, a, from a very large complex building or if you want to demonstrate um, uh, uh, the, the space that you've got available to you to be able to, you know, fit it out with your fixtures and fittings. But... For tasks like being able to maintain assets, sometimes 3D has no benefit to you really. You just want to know from a, a plan what uh, where a particular room is and uh, to know if there's a piece of equipment in that room that needs maintaining. And that's why the can came up with that uh, statement of the best way to, to support operational goals is through just providing them an, a better equipped asset register. Because at the moment, we're rubbish at providing asset registers. They're always wrong. They're incomplete. So how do we do it in such a structured way that we can avoid all that and give them more data than they had before so they can't they don't need to go back out and resurvey the sites? And that's what the 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 understanding was of the BIM maturity levels. Okay. So you can try and overcomplicate it if you want, but that was as simple as, as each level kind of, of, of kind of broke it down to and obviously people tried to de define these other maturity levels about oh, wow do we push it even further now and and support uh, city developments and stuff like that and that's going well beyond just the single built asset and 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 that wasn't really uh, it was it was conceptual back then so we've got this maturity level and as I explained earlier, we've got a process that underpins it. There's something that underpins this maturity level. And that's the process you see in the middle. A client must understand what they need. They must define that need and specify it to their supply chain. The supply chain must comply and, and plan around it. They must deliver the information and then the client must check it and use it. OK, that is the process that essentially underpins that that maturity framework at the bottom there. And that maturity framework is pretty much called BIM level two. It is a little bit more complicated sometimes because that that process you see in the middle is what's defined in PAS 1192. PAS 1192 is the main underlying standard or spe uh, public specification for how BIM level two was meant to operate. But there were other kind of standards referenced in that wedge and and that does make it a bit more complicated because those other standards have some of their own processes in there. But this is the key one. If you don't follow this process, it was basically you're not doing what was required in the maturity framework. And it also made it you can't cheat this process as well. You can't have a client using information and putting it to use if he's not clearly defined what that information is. Now, astonishingly, um, those first two process uh, steps of that process have got nothing to do with our industry okay yes we can support those two steps being done but we cannot 
substitute it or, or complete that ourselves. And, and yes, I will admit that even I, at the start of a tender, have had to give a client an, a, a pre-template, so a pre-formed template, maybe with a bit of input from the client and said, okay, this is an EIR, but we have to do this because the client hasn't done those first two steps. And we've had to quickly substitute something in there because we're on a tight time frame for the, pro, uh, for the tender program. And we've got to get uh, something nailed down to say, look, you don't know what you want. But here is what you're gonna you're gonna get. So let's put this EIR together, put it into the contract, so we're no longer asking in 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 a year or two time what it is that you want and hand it out because that will just cause no end of problems. So that is is cheating the process, and I do very much well believe that when you cheat that process, if you if you put something in there that wasn't uh, specifically well thought out even before the uh, project was con uh, conceptualized then you are cheating it to a certain degree because you could hand over all the digital deliverables you like. You could hand over the best Kobe files in the world, but it could still end up going in a bin if the client is unable to use that information in there because it's not the type of information they want to use um, or they're just unable to consume Kobe uh, without having somebody st uh, sit there and hold their hand and show how they can map to their particular platform, which can take some considerable time. And, and and they don't have that time because by the time the Kobe file is, is finished on a project, typically they need it, you know, before it's even uh, completed, the project's completed, then they, they need to get their FM teams uh, in there very early. And you can't have a, a, a three month mapping period going on because they just need that data now and they, they can't consume it from Kobe. So they go back out to site and they resurvey. So my um, my approach to being able to measure uh, how well um, we are as an industry in making uh, this like maturity framework at the bottom, which is sometimes called BIM Level 2, but it has been rebranded now as the UK BIM framework. Um, but it's also got other descriptions in there like uh, BIM as per ISO 19650. All of these have got a common theme, and that is that process in the middle. And, and, and my presentation focuses on our accomplishment of achieving this maturity framework based on those first two steps. Because like I said, I could concentrate on the, the third and the fourth step, which is the bit where we actually compile all this data and we hand it over. But if you, you haven't considered those first two steps correctly, then what you're handing over could be complete and utter rubbish. It might not be, but it doesn't matter if you've not gone through that process at the start. And that was the key fundamental aspect of, of this whole maturity framework, understanding what you want so that others can give it to you. Then then you've 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 really you've, you've, you've cheated your way of getting through this process. So to understand if we've reached business as usual, what I have done is I have captured data specifically focusing around those two steps so what i have done um, is i've collated some data from 303 projects over five years so in 2014 i had a bit of an issue because i started having these eirs land on my desk and i didn't have time to review every single one and there were pay there were just so many pages in them you know 60 pages sometimes and my job wasn't to review EIRs, albeit I wanted to, because I wanted to know what was starting to flow through the pipeline. You know, what, what was coming from my clients? What were they wanting? Um, so I, I created a, like a register, and that register essentially started collecting some key information about what these clients were asking for. And sometimes the client had no requirements whatsoever. It was the traditional kind of uh, single sentence in a paragraph saying, just give me O&Ms, please. Uh, six copies Libra Arch. But then other times we did have uh, uh, just a client saying, I want BIM level two. So they gave us no EIR. They just went, I want BIM level two or follow PAS 1192 or just give me BIM. So what I did is I created this kind of metric table that said, okay, are, are, are they providing us EIRs? Yes, no. Are they just saying that they want BIM level two? which it pretty much I just translated as they want us to follow PAS 1192 part two, because that's, again, that's what underpins that maturity framework. Yes, no. And then if we do get an EIR, 
what what is that EIR asking for? Is that asking us to follow even more standards? Is it asking us to deliver something we've not done? Uh, have we had to put a plan in place during tender stage? Do they even want a, a, a BEP in place? So I, I, I captured a lot, and I kept this. I've kept this pretty much maintained um, ever since late 2014. Now this pretty much only captures data from uh, tenders and live projects. I don't typically capture data from invitation to tenders because of the, the early nature of those projects. We don't usually get a lot of information from the clients. It's literally like a brief outline saying, look, do you want to, to take part in tendering on this project? And, and, and they give you very little information. Uh, I'm sure many of you know uh, have been involved in invitation to tender, so you know how preliminary they, they, they those kind of tenders are. So they're not included in these figures, but regardless, I've still got 303 uh, that are live, that were live tenders or, or live projects. So, what I've done is I have started to col uh, collect some of the key data from that register over the five years and put it into um, quite a powerful graph. So, again, the data that I am concentrating on is the data that's focused on whether the requirements are coming our way. Okay. So, like I said, if, if a client comes along, gives us an EIR, then that's great. Is that EIR truly as per that process? Did they actually think about their requirements? Did they consider the type of the asset and how that type of asset will have uh, unique requirements? Or have they literally just took a template from another project that's probably nothing like the one that's about to be built and stamped their name on the front page? So that's that's where I'm focusing this data. So as you can see, uh, the graph along the bottom is broken into quarterly data, um, and I've just put the years there. So these are quarterly figures that I'm presenting. And this white line that you see here is the amount of projects that have crossed my desk. And every project that, whether it's uh, got BIM on it or not, cr should cross my desk. So every new tender and every live project I should be aware of. And if I am, uh, if I've been made aware of it, it will become part of my figures, and therefore is part of this graph. Now, as you can see, in some quarters, I've had uh, 23 projects in a quarter across my desk, so that's quite a lot. Um, and I will evaluate it and see: is is it a BIM project or is it not a BIM project? Is there specific information requirements there, or is there no specific information requirements? Um, there was a dip in late 2017, and that's because the former organization I used to work for had a bit of a financial issue. Um, and for some reason, because of that, nobody had confidence in giving them any tenders anymore. <laughs> so there was a dip in my figures. But as you can see from the dotted white line in the middle, um, it's relatively consistent, the projects that cross, cross my desk. Now, what you see here in this blue line is that... Um, of those projects that cross my desk, how many of them reference somewhere in the tender documentation and the project information BIM? So that was probably, uh, I want BIM please, uh, uh, or I want BIM level two. So it's, it's basically referencing just the term. And if you was to evaluate business as usual based on the fact that clients understanding or clients adoption of the term BIM, uh, is business as usual then we're looking pretty damn good because as you can see towards the end almost all of the projects that cross my desk now reference BIM in some shape way or form but we are not checking uh, the progress of business as usual based on the reference of BIM we're using it based on the processes defined in PAS 1192 and now what has been replaced by PAS 1192 is ISO 19650 which I, I explained earlier is pretty much the same process so PAS has gone out the window, ISO has come in, but it's the same process. Now, as you can see, that has grown substantially uh, when I started this. So clients are, are now, they know BIM is important. They don't know much about it, but they do put it into tenders. Now, what this orange line is, is where all of those, out of all those projects in the white line, are ones where an EIR has been provided. So you can see from the early days, I didn't used to get many EIRs at all. I'd get clients saying BIM, but I wouldn't get many EIRs. And around about 2019, about half of the projects roughly had an EIR associated with them. Um, 
which is which is quite a lot. And if you was to consider that in terms of business as usual, and you think half a project, you're thinking, well, that's, it's not great, but it's not too bad. It's still half the projects uh, coming in there. So we're at least half the way there is business as usual. I have noticed though since 2019, especially with big public governed uh, clients, that uh, EIRs are actually dropping now. So where a, a public funded client used, used to provide an EIR, regardless of whether it was good or not, um they 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 don't provide it anymore um and that's a bit of a concern because it does show that they're either losing interest or the people that they trained originally to put these in are probably moved on and they're not retraining and they're telling people that you know you've still got to consider your information requirements so that is the amount of eirs now just because we get an eir doesn't necessarily mean that those two steps of that process have been achieved so as i as i mentioned earlier you've got the EIR that's possibly being put into contracts, but the EIR could contain absolute rubbish. So the stuff that's in there could literally just be a rebranded template, as many of us know. Um, and it's just a uh, insert client name here, insert project name here. And it has no specific bearing on the type of project that's being considered. So albeit we're getting more and more EIRs, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting better. So what I am presenting now is the um, my interpretation of whether those documents that are coming our way are actually clear. So this yellow line represents where I have considered whether the EIR is good or bad. So whether the requirements that we receive are clear or not. And as you can see, this is not really optimistic because the, um, the, the amount of EIRs that I have received um, only a couple of them have actually been clear so I, I, I look at them and I think I can actually build a plan on this maybe a couple of TQs here and there but I can build a plan around this because I, I think this client has truly understood what they want and I get very few of them now you may be thinking right now well that's all all well and good but how do you judge what is good and bad because you, you may say that that's that's rubbish John but I may say that that is very clear and that would be a, a good question to ask and that's why I do have an answer to this so a few years ago I think it was about 2015 I had the issue of um, too many EIRs landing on my desk and not enough time to review them all so I needed to go out there for support and we looked at internal support and external resource support but I couldn't trust the individuals that were undertaking the reviews of the EIR because when I had a second look over them I found a lot of inconsistencies so people would read something in the EIR like for example it would say uh, you are only to use Revit only on this project and and the people that I was uh, either internally or externally having to review these were just marking it that that was fine they'd not even identified it as a risk and that is a risk because your entire supply chain is unlikely to be using a single package uh, of software. So I had a big problem here because there was a lot of statements in these documents that were creating risk and nobody was picking it up. And it was quite often because the, the statement, they, they de didn't understand the statement, so they kind of skipped past it, which is, you know, that's a major fail straight, straight away. Or well, they understood the statement and they didn't see how it was a problem. Because, so what, Revit, everybody likes Revit, why don't we just use it? Because a lot of the individuals have never, uh, they don't have a, a wide scoped understanding of information uh, modeling delivery. So yes, for some designers that's great, but do you have a, enough understanding of the subcontract supply chain? Uh, do all the subcontractors like our steel work guys use Revit? And if you don't really know the answer to that, you shouldn't be reviewing these documents because you need to have quite a wide array of understanding of the whole process about how information is planned how information is delivered where that information comes from so what I, I had to do is I realized I couldn't keep doing this myself so I had to find a way to make it so that when people reviewed this stuff they understood what they were doing so I created a procedure and I still use the same procedure that I created in 2016 I think it was to review EIRs so whenever uh, an EIR came our way, and that could be a single document or it could be a, a spread of documents, 
there was a procedure that basically defined anybody that was reviewing those documents that they had to color code up those documents and the color codes color code system was very simple uh, it was four color codes so gray was anything that was classed as bim prattle so uh, if there was a statement in there saying we believe that bim level two is this important to us and we want to progress it for the next six years that's just prattle that's not what you're meant to have in an employee's information requirements or exchange information requirements it's not telling me anything it's just giving me your viewpoints your opinions it's the same as if you see statements that is literally around um, uh, if, 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 if we want to progress BIM and we want to use this particular methodology, then this is what we expect from you in terms of outputs. And, and it doesn't define what those outputs are. I would also put that down as power because it's still not saying specifically what they want as a requirement. It's just kind of alluding very in a very woolly manner what they want to achieve. But the achievement is basically either BIM level two. Or, or they want digital this and that but they're not specifying what that digital element is so I'll give more examples about that in a moment now my process or procedure that I developed gives many many examples of what each of these color codes are so it will highlight what a typical green example is and a green is <clears throat> when something's written in these EIRs and it is a requirement the requirement is clear and it's low risk so that could be for example that uh, you are to provide us IFC step files for each of the design models in coordination uh, coordination view 2.0. So I know what they're asking for. It's clear to me and I don't see it as a risk. Yellow is a medium risk. So that could be something that might be clear, but I see it as onerous. So, for example, somebody could come in and say, look, I want to use Kobe, and I, but I want you to actually use all the assembly um, uh, tab data as well. And you've got to question that because uh, the assembly section of the uh, uh, Kobe standard is something that can be interpreted in different ways. And you've got to understand how you want to apply that. So I would highlight that as yellow because it's something that we have to consider a lot more or maybe engage more with the client to figure out what is it you want to know? What is it that you consider as an assembly? And what is it that others may just consider as a system? So we have to consider um, that particular example. Now, red um, is typically it's when something's unclear or it is extremely high risk. So unclear could be that saying, you know, I, I want to use Kobe and use all of the tabs. And then you, 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 you've you literally got to go back and say, look, this doesn't make sense. You want me to fill in every single one, but you've not defined what um, connection data you want, what assembly data you want, what, what do you want to know in terms of coordinates? Is that really useful to you? Because that's a lot of data we've got to collect and what is the base point for that coordinate? Because the, the COBE standard, um, as defined by the National BIM standard, um, excludes that from its scope. Uh, so there is a statement in the National BIM standard that says the actual specification that sits behind how COBE is uh, delivered, that is actually excluded from the scope. So that has to be considered about how we actually deliver that and what the value is. Sometimes a, a red could be something like you are only to use Revit only under no other circumstances are you to use any other application. That is a risk because our supply chain is not going to be able to facilitate that for all packages, especially on the subcontractor side. And then we, we get into that kind of field where we've got to then pay somebody else to try and duplicate a design in Revit. And I can't always predict the accuracy. Of that because it is a fabrication essentially it's a fake representation of the 2d or whatever the standard other applications design was so what you see on screen at the moment um, is a real EIR so this EIR comes from a public sector client um, I'm not sure why but um, when when this came and landed on my desk it was different to their typical template they use so I don't know how this template came to be but I've censored a lot of the, the information on it so that it, it doesn't name and shame because naming and shaming gets me in nothing but trouble. But as you can see, uh, this document gets stamped with a, 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 a label and that's how my procedures define that this must be done. And it says that, you know, anything that's red is a risk, anything that's yellow is a requirement, green is acceptable, gray is explanatory rubbish. Um, 
Now, when this is actually marked up, so if it's not marked up by me and it's marked up by somebody I need support from, they will then send this to me with this report sheet. So my procedure actually defines they've got to fill in a report and that's pretty much highlighting the top five risks and what they consider as a mitigation. So do we have to go back to the client and TQ it or do we simply exclude that from our BIM execution plan to make sure that we're not we're not signing up to something that we don't agree with or or that's impossible in, in some regards unless you've got the right amount of money so what you will see here is most of this document is explanatory rubbish so the first two or three pages here is just about the vision of BIM and how BIM can support us there's a requirement there about a BIM execution plan okay and this document should be included in all subcontracts okay that's a requirement the supplier shall review the IDP provided. That was a risk because they provided a template um, that we we don't typically use um, in that way to support the goal that we wanted. So they provided essentially a delivery plan for managing our own deliverables, but it didn't. It wasn't dynamic enough. It didn't have the necessary uh, uh, functionality to be able to manage and, and track those deliverables. So it was almost like, well, now we've got to maintain two documents if you really want us to use this because our delivery plan manages uh, not just when uh, that particular drawing will come at stage two, we want to know the date it comes at that stage. And we also have multiple dates. We want to know when it's going to come to us for comment, when it's going to come to us for procurement, for client approval and for construction. So there's lots of dates to consider and sometimes it can happen all in one stage. So, um, <clears throat> The, the, the providing us templates sometimes limits our capability and that is a risk that we have to consider now on this last page um, there is a red one here and that was because uh, the client decided uh, that the supplier will respond with their own proposals for date requirements so they have automatically in that single sentence stated that they haven't really considered their date requirements as per the first two steps of the process outlined in PAS 1192 part two or ISO 9650 part two. Um, and so that we have to come up with our own proposal, which is a risk because yes, we can come up with something, but does that mean then when we come up with something, we're gonna be picking and choosing for ages, even probably after the contract sign because we won't be able to nail anything down. It's just not where we wanna be. It's not what the, um, the point of the maturity framework, which is BIM level two or the UK BIM framework is, 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 is trying to support. And then we've got more explanatory rubbish there. So we've got a, an example there where they've decided just to copy and paste text that has come out of BS 1192 part four. And they don't need to do that. Pages and pages copied from another standard that I've got available to me. All they've got to say is follow BS 1192 part four and I will see all these requirements anyway. So um, why, why have they included that in there? And you can see there's an example there where it's been highlighted yellow about systems because it says every component will be assigned to at least one system. <clears throat> now, we systems are again are a bit subjective, and a lot of platforms, facility management platforms, manage systems in very strange ways. They're not typically the way that we see it when we're designing. Their idea of a system is very much uh, this particular switch operates this particular thing, but that thing could actually be formed part of four or five systems and we've not actually associated that from a design perspective as part of that switch. So it's something that we usually have to challenge to say what, what specific system information do you want and how do you structure it? So we, we usually quiz that a bit more if we actually use that system sheet because uh, sometimes we don't always do it for that sake. So what now? So. I've kind of just demonstrated to you that we still get rubbish EIRs. We have a very disciplined procedure to review those EIRs to make sure that they are clear or to make sure if they are rubbish, why they're rubbish. So we have a way of judging these first two components that make up PAS 1192 part two and ISO 19650 part two. Two critical components that every other component that follows it can't really be done reliably uh, if you're filling that in with a stopgap. So if you're filling it in with blank templates or, or uh, any other kind of um, uh, false um, representation of a requirement, uh, you, you're only creating a risk. And that risk could be that you go to all this effort collecting all this data and it can't be used anyway. And it ends up in that drawer because it doesn't, it, it doesn't meet the requirements, the true requirements, whether that be form or function. 
but we have made re remarkable strides in our industry alone um so we have digitized more we we have now a focus on information management because of that first catalyst i believe that our industry realizes the importance of information management to a degree albeit it's still a small selection of individuals trying to push the importance and then the rest of the organization doesn't care and they carry on using email but the 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 the, the at least there is a push there now which there wasn't before um and we can and we can still try and judge our own performances and a, and a lot of projects go you know we are a bim level 2 project or we are a uk bim framework iso 19650 compliant project whatever because they judge their progress and performance based on the fourth step of this process which is they have been able to supply uh, asset data and models and, and ifc and all this uh, right at that step four but when it gets to step five and the client is meant to check it and use it, the client doesn't check it or when they go to use it, they can't use it because it's not the data they wanted or it's not in the format that they can use straight away. And by the time they do convert it to a format they can use through mapping, um, it's too late. The, the, the facility manager has gone back out to site to, to resurvey. <clears throat> so there is some key questions that we need to ask ourselves really uh, um, when considering the business as usual question can our industry ever achieve business as usual within the context of the whole life maturity framework that is ISO 19650 so that's the the BIM level 2 or the UK BIM framework if those that seek our services so our clients continue to fail to complete those first two critical steps so can we ever achieve the original goal of that business as usual which is this whole life maturity framework when those first two steps have got nothing to do with us Okay, like I say, we can support it, but we can't replace it. We can't fill that in um, as, a, as a construction industry. And that is a, a very serious question. And that even means that we, we continue down the road with our current target, our current business as usual target that focuses on this whole life bit, even though that a lot of this whole life um, doesn't include uh, our industry. Um, or we refocus that business as usual, maybe just to focus on the steps that, that our industry focuses on, which is typically the second and the, uh, the the third and the fourth step in that process. The second consideration is, so let's say um, by some miracle, we do get the two components at the start of this process. So we get clients that really do start to take import, uh, understand the importance of defining their information requirements. And they, they pass those requirements down to us correctly at the start of every tender that we get involved in. What if they don't actually check or use that at the very end? So I've been on a lot of projects where information requirements have been defined relatively well, albeit I still don't believe truly because the, they're either full of wooliness or they were based on templates. But to some degree, they've got some requirements in there that that they want to use but they get handed over the the asset register at the end which could be in the form of kobe and they don't bother checking it and then they get to the point where they go to procure their fm contractor if they're not already on board they give it to them and the fm contractor realizes it's rubbish and they can't use it and they have to go back out and start and resurvey so that is um that is another issue um here because that's another step that we can't really do for them and yet it's an in, it's a target that's based on our industry as well of reaching that business as usual. So that's three steps um, that's not part of our industry out of a five step process. So if we do continue to get poor information requirements um, or those that do define can't use or, 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 or they don't, the information requirements that they take at the end of the project, they don't actually uh, use that information to support whatever that operational target is should we refocus our business as usual goals because we are investing a huge amount of our our resources to achieving what is defined in PAS 1192 and ISO 9650 as part of this process and we are losing so much of it because of those first two steps not being there out of all those projects i received and i showed you how many of them i was receiving poor information requirements um they're all things we've had to invest a huge amount of time on to make sure we hand over the data and the, the documents and the models if the, if that was a requirement only to find that it will probably end up in a draw because it was still not based on their true requirements so that was um yeah, that was disheartening 
Where should we go now? So I think we do need to refocus the public sector mandate. Um, so from 2011, the mandate went live. In 2015, the entire government sector basically believed that they had already achieved BIM Level 2 from their perspective in the sense that they had achieved those first two steps. So they believed that they had already got uh, clear information requirements in place and a set of processes, but they didn't. They had templates in place and I was supporting free government clients at the time trying to help them understand their information requirements. They define, they, they implemented no guidance um, and, and set process documents that told their project managers and whoever they appointed to help support built assets to actually use these documents and how to configure them. It was very basic guidance in some of the documents. They simply put like comments in the Word document saying anything that's yellow uh, highlighted just replace with with like the project name and the, the project specific text there was very few that had actually gone the whole way and said you know this needs to be developed from scratch and that is an issue so I think it needs to refocus in terms of the goals but also to push it again because now we are seeing in the past year that clients that did used to provide EIRs are either not providing them at all anymore and this is on the public side the private sector obviously is, is completely up to them but on the public side they don't bother providing them anymore or if they do provide them most of them don't even have any um uh, uh, uh project specific amended templates anymore so where it used to say insert project name here it still says insert project name they haven't even bothered to update the template it's just a blank template that the centers and that's that's really disheartening so i think that needs to be refocused um, by the government I think there needs to be better support for the public sector as well. So I think a new for, uh, reformed working group needs to support them. And I do believe um, uh, the UK BIM Alliance needs to get more involved here now. Um, so I, I believe that they need to refocus, help them refocus into a new mandate, but help them actually get uh, get into a better frame of mind than they did before. So don't just create templates and think your job is done. How are you really digging down into your to your organization which is huge you know some of these public organizations are massive they, they 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 take months to understand all the different facets and to understand how each facet has their own information requirements and, and how that might draw from the asset that's being built and and none of that was really done and and i, I can tell you now i sat in a lot of the big ones on the, the public side and there was a couple of individuals like there was one individual from the fm side but he, actually he was from carillion um, so he was actually just a supplier. He wasn't, and, and he understood his, his stuff from his side of things. But there was no one actually from uh, uh, that large um, public client that understood facility management in terms of the wider benefit and, and, and what must be strategically delivered. And that was really disheartening because the, the whole thing was pretty much led by a BIM consultant in the room, and they pretty much defined what the requirements should be. Uh, just taking bits of input from some people around the table and that was that was not good and the final step is there needs to be a reintroduction of the failed 2016 stretch target and that's stretch not stretched so many of you may not be aware but the april mandate in 2016 wasn't the only mandate so the april one was any new project from april 2016 must have uh, the bim level 2 process implemented which is that process at the top there what was implemented or stated in 2015 was that it's all well and good having uh, these EIRs come into the arena and we start delivering this, but who's checking the data on the client side? So the stretch target was that the, the public sector must have a strategy in place for being able to check deliverables before they, they, they use them so that they can validate it or reject it. That target vanished okay so it was it got right up to october and everybody on social media was like well what's happening you know has that objective been met and there was no formal response nobody and that is a real shame because i remember in 2015 um, when i was part of a working group and mark view said you know the stretch target is the most important one because if you don't if you go through all this process of defining your requirements and nobody's checking it just before it gets handed over that's an issue and it is an issue because i have supported many private and public clients to check these digital deliverables like Kobe handed over. Um, and I look at them and I go, this is beyond rubbish. It is it is crazy. Reject it and send it back to the contractor. But they can't because they've already accepted it. 
it got issued to them, they accepted it, the project's come to a close, and then they've asked me to check it before it goes over to the FM contract because the project's about to go live or something like that, and, and they can't reject it and send it back. And it's it's crazy. And that's, that's why that uh, checking process must be implemented early. And some do have, like a BIM consultant um, appointed that will do that check. But you would you would not believe how poor those checks are still done by those consultants. So they will run it through like a quality control tool, which will say yes, all the cells have been filled in and they seem to follow the basic rules. But then you look at it and they've not done any of the sense checks. So you know you you'll look at the component sheet in Kobe, and you'll see something that appears to have a classification of uh, a handling unit. And then you you look at the 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 component name and it's just a, a mixture of random letters and numbers. And then you look at the space name. So this is where this air handling unit is meant to be, even though I don't understand the, the designation given to it and I can't find it on any of the plans or schematics. I look at the space name and it says like two seven four six four four six four, and I know that that's also not on any of my floor plans. So I'm screwed because I can't find the component because it doesn't exist in any of the schematics or drawings. And I can't find the room because that doesn't exist in any of the plans. And I've got, I might as well just chuck it away now because the only way to fix it is if I, I find out why, how this mismatched parameter ended up in there. And I'm not going to do that. So that target was missed. And now every digital handover, digital delivery handover that's handed over to the client um, on the public side is a mixture of rubbish uh, to partially good. Um, so no clear consistent procedure was implemented on the government side to say these are the checks you have to do on the kobe front because kobe was obviously the mandated delivery mechanism and that's really disappointing um what i would say is there is a cultural issue as well so well, not last year the year before i i was really disheartened uh, because I, I supported a very large project um in their ability to uh, hand over information requirements so the client did do quite well at defining their information requirements it was a very high value project so I, I decided to support them and I made sure that our digital deliverables in terms of the Kobe handover was correct and it was correct I can assure you now what made it even more enjoyable for me to support was the fact that part of my business was then going to be helping maintain uh, and operate that building okay so there was a lot in it for us to get this right now I get towards the end of the project and I'm told by our maintenance division the bit of my business that, that does the operational maintenance and I'm told by them that they're going to chuck my Kobe file or the code file I've supported in the bin and I go what <laughs> don't, don't don't make jokes because that's not funny and <clears throat> I found out it was because this public client and they've done the same thing for the last 15 years was to have a, a, a preliminary fee in the costs for the operational manager, so the FM manager, to go out onto site and survey and get a, you know, a list of all the equipment. So there's a, there was a fee in there and it was quite, quite a lot of money as well. And I said to him, well, you don't need to do that resurvey because you've got all the data there. And he said, no, we're not going to turn down that money. I'm going to go back outside and resurvey. And I says, well, can't, can you at least use that uh, resurvey to collect some of the data maybe we didn't collect or take some extra precautions like pictures? And he was basically, no, I'm just going <clears> to <throat> collect it all again because I need to re, uh, recollect this. And also we're basically told by our PI insurers that we can't rely our entire maintenance schedule based on the data you have provide, provided. And that was that was really disheartening. So essentially, all that work that had gone into providing that asset register in the form of Kobe was going to go into the bin because they had been paid and told that they can't rely on our data because they didn't trust it uh, to go back out on site and recollect all that information. And I'm sure it was around about the six figure sum. So that is an example. And, and, and I only knew about this for the simple fact that we were also doing the facility management for all the other organizations out there, I'm sure that they probably uh, that are on the operational side, they probably got a fee in there as well to go out on site and resurvey. So it does make me wonder how much of that public money is still going into that process. So I hope you found this uh, presentation useful. Um, this was the one that was shown at BIM Show Live. If you've got any questions, you can drop them to me directly and I will uh, try my best to answer them. So. 
thank you for listening and I will uh, add a few more videos in the near future. Thank you.